G'day brothers and sisters, this is The Other Paul and I'm finally joined on my channel this time with the legendary Alan Rule. Alan, how are you going, mate? Well, thank you for the kind words, legendary. And uh, yeah, it's nice being on your channel. As um, as some people may uh, not know, The Other Paul was on my channel a few weeks uh-huh. back where we were... Uh, dismantling well he was dismantling the the arguments that the rabbis bring forward about there being a, a, a imaginary torah that that's oral and of course i got shredded completely and <laughs> yeah so so thanks for having me on i hope everyone's having a good lent and holy week um yes 100 percent, 100 percent. i'm about to my my friends because like the funny thing, because like you, you, you probably, you probably know, you, you know, you definitely know about it and tolerate it. But like, I do a lot of my stuff, um, a lot of my content critiquing Roman Catholicism, and and to to to, I don't want to bully you guys. Don't worry, I am going to some Eastern Orthodoxy stuff in the future, and even high church Protestants as well. Because like you know, anywhere I can, anywhere I can critique what I think is untrue, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for that within the Christian traditions. But um, <clears throat> um, ironically with that most of my closest friends are really traditionalist Catholics. Um, so it's, it's really funny, our relationships. And they just messaged me now that in the time of this stream, it sucks. Like a bunch of them are going to one of the boys place to actually watch the passion of the Christ this good Friday. Um, so sucks. I got to miss that out, but that is my yearly tradition anyway. So I'll be doing that as well. So hopefully everybody watching is having a fantastic good Friday, at least here in Australia, it's Friday today. So God willing, that is the case. Um, and yes, so today we are doing a nice crash course in crusades history specifically bad crusades history how to avoid it how to properly approach the topic yourself and alan rule is no better per- <clears throat> no better person i know to, uh, there is no better person sorry than alan rule that i know to ask since he is a man who from what i've seen is neck deep in the primary sources of crusades history um so uh, i reckon as a as a basic nice starter uh, what's the deal, Alan, with your fascination in Crusades history? What 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 got you to jump right into that? <clears throat> well, of course, uh, I'm Catholic, right? And like a lot of people growing up would kind of use that as like a battering ram to like attack the church and show how violent uh, Christianity is. And of course, after 9-11... Uh, mm-hmm. There, there's like, well, you, you know, uh, yeah, some Islamic extremists did this, but you know, we did the Crusades a few hundred years back. We were no different, you know. We were just like them, and um, and of course, uh, of course, I knew there was probably more to the story than that. But uh, of course, what is a story? And thank God we live in an age where so much is translated. You don't have to learn Greek or Latin or speak Arabic or anything like that. You, you, you can get most of this stuff in English. Not everything has been translated, but enough of the primary sources um, have been translated. So prior to, um, well, I suppose that's the, the next question. But yeah, that's how I I, I, I got interested in it. Um, when And this is going to come up again. When someone tries to to give an overall black and white narrative of any historical thing, it's probably wrong. Not always, but probably wrong. Like uh, in Canada right now, we've got this with residential schools. I don't know if that's made international news yet, but uh, Mm. mass graves found, of course, that's all completely debunked by Lauren Southern and other people too. It was fake. Um, Yeah, so so like the, the thing is, the the thing I've learned in st- studying history, not just Crusades history, but history in general, is people don't know how to think rationally, approach sources, uh, approach subjects in general. You know, we all want the nice narr- the nice narrative, but when there's a nice overall narrative, get suspicious because usually there's a lot of shades of gray involved. That's not black yeah. and white. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Pog, what is this, really, Cuz? Hello, but <laughs> what are you saying here, man? Really, you're trying to get me nuked from YouTube this early? Come on, Cuz, come on. <laughs> but hello, good to see. You. <laughs> oh dear. And then we got Jack Ray here saying, "Yeah, defensive actions are so bad. Pop history of the Crusades. Well, 
so from what I, from what I've read, it's more like this. There's like the Crusaders. It, it's some there's some defensive actions, but it's also like counter offensive after like many many long times of encroachment of of Islamic invasions. So strictly speaking, at least from what I know, just like as a brief tangent, strictly speaking, from what I know, the first Crusade was offensive but it came on the heels of like centuries of constant constant muslim encroachment on the christian world if i'm not mistaken yeah that's true and there's a more immediate context to the first crusade than just islamic aggression specifically yeah. turkish aggression uh because yeah. the turks uh spilled on to the scene in the mid 11th century and started terrorizing the byzantine empire although <laughs> Although, and, and like, this is the thing I like to put out. They say, oh, the Ye European Christians had no right to be there. And it's like, okay, well, the the mayor. Have any right to be there. The Turks <laughs> were from Central Asia, you know. How, uh, how about Salahuddin or Saladin, as he's called? He's from n northern Iraq. Did he have right to control <laughs> over Jerusalem? How about, uh, in, in fact, a lot of people like to to knock the crusades and they said oh they went to beat up on the poor muslims go ask them what islamic group was in charge of jerusalem at that time mm -hmm. just just ask them that and it's it's a group based out of africa and they were shia m muslims who here Ooh. believe that that shias from africa have the right to jerusalem Mm, course, very spicy course. indeed. It's course, it's almost no. it's almost as if the ancients and the medievals just didn't have our fluffy concepts of absolute property and national boundary rights. Who flipping knew? It's wow. No. It's almost like the the entire and and just to qualify for people, um, Alan Rule's audio quality is fine. His video quality kind of chops up a little bit here. I don't know what's happening, um, but otherwise his audio should is is, is nice and fine. So don't let that distract you. But anyway, <clears throat> it's almost like. The entire history of the human race has been people groups wanting control of certain lands for their own interests. It's almost as if that's been the norm for human history forever. It's almost as if the um, what you call it, the Treaty of Westphalia was not original to the human race. It's almost as if it hasn't been there for like what absolute millennia that we've been fighting over territory for. Far out! How amazing! But I reckon we jump right into right into our first major question of this now so we've seen that you're really interested with crusade history because of the basically because of the the, the crap that was started to be thrown at uh christians and particularly catholics and roman catholicism because of the history of the crusades <clears throat> and the alleged oh crusade men do bad thing and uh muslim was just humane warrior and all that stuff and so now we've covered your interest with it tell us how you approach studying crusade history because i remember you told me told me one detail in particular that was quite interesting with how basically you pr much prefer primary sources over secondary so how do you approach the study of the crusades of history in history okay well first of all uh like um an example a few days ago was the anniversary of the fourth crusade that's th mm. the infamous sack of uh the crusader sack constantinople and that's pretty much all anyone knows Oh, in, in 1204, the Crusaders sacked Constantinople. Look how bad the Crusaders are. And that's all anyone knows. No one knows anything else. Why they were going there instead of Jerusalem. Uh, did the Pope support it or did he order it or was... And so, uh, for like, for example, I write for a Catholic online m magazine called uh, 1 Peter 5. And I just oh, published okay. an article there on April 12th. It's 5,000 words. Uh, you can go check it out yourself at 1peter5.com. And um, now, although there is some modern scholars quoted, there are some modern scholars quoted, um, that was not my idea. Dia, that's something the, the editor wanted to do and and of course i was fine with incorporating that because i had given all the uh uh the primary sources as well but uh l let me show you how i studied the yeah. um the uh the fourth crusade 
I've got Chronicles of the the Crusade here. This is from Penguin. You can pick this up for about twenty bucks. Uh, I, 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 I don't. So I give don't me the name that. again because the camera's okay. blurry, so we can't really see it. So okay. the Chronicles of the Crusade, Penguin. Yeah, yeah. It's got it's got two chronicles here. It's got Geoffroy de Villardoin. He and it's got another one from the Seventh Crusade. That's King Louis okay. the Ninth. But he's not important to the Fourth Crusade. So yeah, and this guy was kind of like an admin on the Crusade. Okay. So he he he's kind of like an admin on the Crusade. So he's good with all the paperwork and stuff. And then also, I used Robert of Clary. And let mm -hmm. me show you the spine here. Who was on the Fourth Crusade as well? But he's a bit different. He's a knight who, who was on the Crusade, and he actually oh, wow. gives a lot of details in all the battles. So can you say uh, can you say his name again? R Robert of Clary Robert? C L A R I. So yeah. so Clary just Clary C L A R I. Yeah, Robert yeah, and Clary and his account. Is there like a name to it or? Uh, it's called um, um, it's called the Conquest of Constantinople by Robert of Clary. Yeah. Perfect, and, perfect. Yeah, it's a bit more expensive. Uh, it's <clears throat> probably twice as much as this. Still not that expensive. Um, and so, yeah, he's a knight on the Fourth Crusade. So he gives a lot of detail in th the battles, whereas he talks about the battles, but he'll just gloss over them, you know. And um, another thing was, th this is by a clergyman. Now, I don't believe he was on the Crusade, but his brother was on the crusade so he uh, basically got mm. everything from his brother his brother was a clergyman on the, the crusade yeah uh, and so, this so what's this one called because the camera is still like really really pixelated it's called the capture of constantinople by gunther of paris um oh yeah yeah and it's about 40 bucks again i don't know how much the australian currency is worth but in terms of, of Canadian Crap. dollars. <laughs> and so three people who were on the crusade, right? Okay. Now I've also got one called O City of Byzantium, the, the Annals of Niketis Cognatus. Now he was um, a, a, a Greek who was in Constantinople at the time. So he's a first-hand account from the Greek perspective. Okay, so we got two sides going, the Crusaders and the Greek. Mm. And th this is actually a good source for a lot of things. It's good mm. for the Third Crusade as well, because uh, he kind of knows what's going on in the whole empire. And they had stopped in Cyprus, uh, and they talked about the, the crazy man, Isaac Comnenus, who had taken over Cyprus and stuff like that. But he starts his chronicle from the year... 1118. So I don't know if you've ever read the Alexiad by Anna Comnena. He's a continuation no. uh, of what happened after Alexius Comnena died. He okay. was the father of Anna Comnena. So a Greek perspective, in addition to those three perspectives. I got one more book here. Mm -hmm. This is called Contemporary Sources for the Fourth Crusade by Alfred J. Andrea. Now, th this is mainly uh, correspondence between the Pope and the the Crusaders, or the Pope mm -hmm. and uh, certain people in the Byzantine Empire, and it's got a few smaller accounts as well. So, basically, th that is um, all the stuff. In fact, I sent an email to Professor Thomas M M Madden, who is a a crusade scholar in the States. And mm -hmm. I said, look, I've got these four accounts. Is there anything else in English? And then he's like, yeah, there's this. And, and the contemporary sources one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Very good. Uh, he, yeah, he seemed shocked. I had, <laughs> I'd read all this stuff, but <laughs> uh, like, yeah, if I want, there are books on the fourth crusade. I could go buy them. <laughs> but that's not mm -hmm. really my thing. There's another reason to go for the primary sources. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, like, for example, to know how people thought about this through history. Like, for example, th this was the most 
common account through history, Geoffroy de Villehardouin. Okay. The, so, so if you want to know, say you're a guy who lives in 1600 and you're, you're pretty much educated enough to know how to read, uh, you're probably going to read this. Of course, you're, you're going to read it in Latin. But if you read this, you, you probably know what an average educated person thought about it back in in 1600 in France or in Spain or or whatnot. Okay. So, uh, so that's another re reason to go these sources. And this is how, uh, like, for example, I studied the Third Crusade the same way. Just let me show you something. Um, the, the the Third Crusade is the famous one with Richard the Lionheart, of course. Uh, of course, I got the primary account of his crusade. Uh, the okay. gets the Regis Ricardi, the Chronicle of the Third Crusade. And I've got also the rare and excellent history of Saladin by Bahal Dean Ibn Shaddad. This is written by a friend of Saladin who accompanied him into battle. And Fine. so, like, so these two books, like, we'll talk about the same battle, like the Battle of Jaffa, the Battle of Arsif, all the big battles That's of the Third Crusade, but from the two different perspectives. And it's amazing how much they complement each other. And of course, as you know, good. on the Third Crusade, there was, uh, you, you had the King of France, uh, King Philip II and King R R Richard the Lionheart. You also had Frederick Barbarossa who made his way over land. And I've got the primary accounts with him. And so... And then what's that one called? Because like, I, I don't know what's oh. up with your camera, man. It's still like mad pixelated. Oh, sorry. It, it's called the Crusade of Frederick Barbarossa: the the okay. history of the expedition of the Emperor Frederick and related texts. So, um, yeah, no, it, it's got all of, of Frederick, and it's interesting because the because <laughs> they don't like R R Richard the Lionheart. Because keep in mind, uh, a thing that's interesting about the Crusades: there's a lot of infighting on both sides that kind of gets ignored. Um, like the 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 Islamic empires are always fighting with each other yep. and among each other. Um, like as soon as, as Saladin dies, he wanted his kids to take over, but his brother comes in and tries to poison his kids and take over, and his brother eventually comes to power and takes over. So, right. um, yeah, and... Uh, there's a ton of infighting between the yeah. French and the Germans and uh Yeah. Yeah. So uh And and yeah. so to so to summarize basically your method is pretty much pretty much my dream way of doing history is just only I probably I probably read a few more secondary scholars in terms of ratio, but like you're just like just go to the primary. I do not care what some scholar a thousand years after the fact says. That's basically your method. Yeah. And uh like, like I try to stick to as primary as possible. That's how I do all my r research, not just uh, the, the Crusades, Sorry. but like, but like I, I, I talk with people on on subjects like the the Crusades, for example, and they've only read the modern scholars, and of course, it's not nothing, but um, the, the, a lot of times people put their spin. Now, now these sources have spin as well. Like, just because you're a primary source doesn't mean you're not super biased or part biased. But the thing is, how many degrees of bias do you want? One or a whole bunch? So, mm. yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So that's 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 the way to do it. That's the way to do it, ladies and gentlemen. 100 percent on board with this. Dive neck deep into primary sources yourself when you're doing your study of history particularly with contentious topics like this one, because as we'll be moving on to now, a lot of the bad takes on historical topics, and in this case, the Crusades, tend to come from people who just have not read those sources, or even if they do, um, their reading comprehension is questionable at best. So to move to that, can you give us some really, really bad common takes on Crusade history and then what the, basically the refutation to those, those claims? Okay, well, um, the, there's something my mom told me 
once. Uh, she took a, a, a history course in university, and she had a prof that who said, "There's no more history, only journalism." So, <laughs> because, because journalism sells, you know, and um, and people have a nice, comfortable narrative that they want. That's the mm. narrative that they want. Uh, and then, and keep in mind, there are two extremes. There's the people that say, oh, the, the Crusades were the worst. It was just a bunch of Christians going to kill a bunch of noble Islamic people. And then there's people that are like, oh, they're so glorious, deus vault, you know, and like <laughs> love everything about it. Th 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 those are two extremes. The truth is these were historical events. Uh, you may have supported them. You may have not supported them, but there are details and it, it, it's good to read all those details now why do the crusades kind of have a bad name all right mm -hmm. let's think i i live in canada you you live in australia there's a lot of groups of people there's catholics there's protestants you got a, the muslims the jews the secular secularists l leftists those last two mm -hmm. often go hand in hand though not always and so if you go up to these people and ask them, what do you think about medieval Christianity? Oh, geez. <laughs> They'll kind of be like, oh, yeah, about that. So already things are tarred from the uh, the outset. But, um, uh, and, and who's the most important figure in me medieval Christianity? It's the Pope, right? He's the highest authority in Europe. Uh, and of course... So the Pope, Pope orders, so it's not a rogue, the most important figure in the church commands people to go to a country that's not theirs. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's a bunch of Christians going into non-Christian land to cause trouble. Now, we need to remember, I touched on this, this earlier, that... Um, the the vast majority if you go and read the speeches about five or six accounts of the speech exist it's all to fight the turk because in 1071 now it, now in the seventh century a lot of that land had been conquered by arabs but by about the year about 800 their steam for jihad had cooled off and they just started to build civilization now all the jihad's gone, let's go and, and build a civilization. And the Christians, uh, they were okay. They found an equilibrium there. Okay. And then um, in 1071, you have uh, a battle in eastern Anatolia. The Turks, who had just come from uh, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan through Persia, they had come and they spilled into Anatolia and the Middle East. They had taken over most of Anatolia, that's modern-day Turkey, um, and they had taken over the Middle East as well. And so a, a new player is on the... Uh, and the Turks are very re recent converts to Islam, and mm. so they got the spirit <clears throat> for jihad going. Um. And so if you take a look at, uh, and now uh, there's something interesting. The Pope actually wanted, Popes that were a bit earlier actually wanted to call Crusades as well. Uh, okay. In fact, uh, Pope, Pope, Pope Gregory VII, I just, I got his letters over there. He wanted to call the Crusade. And in the exact same way as Pope Urban II with one difference, he actually wanted to lead the troops. And he wanted to Far leave out. the Holy Roman Emperor in charge of Europe. The same guy he would end up excommunicating later. <laughs> which is a bit ironic. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was Henry the Fourth, that scoundrel. <clears throat> and so, so just to just to just to make this clear for everyone. Um okay, no, first of all, QA people coming at the very end. So dump your questions in there, super mm -hmm. chats and people who were former patrons before i got nuked for hate speech um you get priority so uh yay um and uh yep and then also just to 
So to make this one clear right now, so this is basically demythologizing the extremes of the, the extreme views of like, oh, uh, crusade man, good Muslim man, bad, or Saladin man, so humane, crusader, human rights abusers, or basically just demythologizing those extremes and showing eh, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not that easy. So this is basically what you're doing right now. Yeah. So uh, the the famous speech, the Council of Claremont, is in in uh, is in 1095, 1096. Then they rendezvous at Constantinople about a year later, and they. Um, I how I do it. <laughs> there we go. Camera's better again. <laughs> okay. Or at least more. So. They rendezvous at Constantinople. Uh, they first restore the city of Nicaea. You guys probably know the Council of Nicaea. That's the first battle of the Crusades. They they take back that city for the Byzantine Empire. Then they make their way south, and um, th they get into a huge battle at uh, a place called Dori Lam, wh where they defeat the Turks. Now, um, some history here. When the Turks had spilt over into the region, they had split into two empires, the Sultanate of Rum and the Seljuk Empire. Now, the Sultanate of Rum was the first two battles, at Nicaea and Tori Lam. Then they go to siege Antioch. Now, this is a separate Turkish empire. Remember, they had split. This is the Seljuk Empire. They're sieging um the uh the, the the they're sieging antioch and they eventually take the city and find the holy lands although that's that's disputed i could go go more into that but um so they take antioch and while this is going on keep in mind the turks have suffered countless l losses it's hurting their empire the uh the shia group from africa who the Turks had taken over J Jerusalem from, called the Fatimids, take Jerusalem back. And they actually send a letter to the Crusaders. And they're like, hey, you know, the, the Turks are my enemy too. Let's team up, fight these people. The, the Crusaders weren't having any of that. So they <laughs> come down to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, they siege it. It's in the summer. I can't remember the exact day that they take it. I think it's July. And so um, they uh, they take the city and they sack it. Now, they say, it's commonly believed that, oh, they killed everyone inside the walls. No, a lot of people... And the, and, and the blood went up to people's knees or something like that, if I remember one of those accounts. And people just yeah. latch onto that one. <laughs> yeah, and that's obviously using hyperbole. Like, for example, yeah. if I'm watching a hockey game... And I said, oh, the Flames just slaughtered the Oilers. No, slaughtered means they <laughs> scored more goals, you know, and won. Yes. You know? <laughs> it's not like the Flames came out with swords and hacked them to bits, you know. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, th they're using like apocalyptic imagery, you know, things like that, you know. And, mm. yeah, so it, it's the, the amount of blood that you would need to have the bloods up to the hoofs of the horse, especially in a city like Jerusalem on a hill, is, is, yeah. is just impossible. Now... <laughs> Now, it's true that a good chunk of people were killed. A, a large amount of people were killed. So that's mm -hmm. not exactly a, a bright spot for the Crusaders. Um, but it's not the whole city. And that's one of the lies in Kingdom of Heaven. It's like, oh, the Muslims Ooh. killed everyone. Like, like Because when he's negotiating with Salah ad at the end, it's like, oh, the Muslims... Uh, uh, it's like when, when the Christians took it, they killed all the Muslims inside the walls. And it's funny that Salahuddin, uh, he, he destroyed the Fatimid Empire because they had taken Jerusalem from the Fatimids. It's Salahuddin who didn't believe they were true Muslims because they were Shias. He destroyed their, their empire in the early 1170s. But, of course, no one knows that, right? So, mm. if Big so, so I mean, uh, as, per, as per the thumbnail of this video, Saladin was just a totally humane human rights warrior. I mean, everyone knows that. <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, I've heard great things about him. I heard he was a pretty epic general, but just, just, just for mythology around any figures, you know. <laughs> well, he he's known. 
he's he's a lot more of a statesman than a good general. He he's a very good statesman. He was able to <clears throat> unite Syria and Egypt, and he destroyed the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt, which is a Shiite <laughs> caliphate. In fact, it's very similar to what Mustafa Kemal Ataturk did to the Sunni Caliphate in in, in Turkey. Like they're like, okay, we'll incorporate into our system. Then as soon as the caliph dies, they just don't appoint another one. It's like, all right, we're gonna go with the Sunni caliph in caliph in Iraq right now. That's what Saladin said. And the the people of Egypt, you know, they didn't really have a choice, right? So um so technically when you think about it, um who, who did Jerusalem belong to? A bunch of African Shias. Turkish Sunnis from Central Asia, Christians from U Europe, they're all pretty foreign to the area. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. if the Christians are going to get heck, spread some hate in those other two directions as well. Mm -hmm. And because yeah. uh, remember, there's facts and the narrative. There's history, then there's journalism. Yes. And yes. what we want to do is history. And so, uh, yeah, have you got any uh questions or follow up anything i i didn't cover there 100 i reckon i reckon we dive into some more kingdom of heaven trash Ooh, because okay. that, that'll be the fun part of this because i've got to say myself right now i know that that movie is straight up propaganda yeah um yeah. atheistic and oh my poor muslim pop propaganda and yet as just just from a pure filmmaking standpoint i still love it because it is extremely well made very uh, and lovely. particularly that one scene, that one scene where the Crusader army is marching, and you just see, you just see like the massive, massive army marching forward, and they have the huge golden cross at the front. That shot is 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 something really incredible, and it's used in, it's been used in a number, a number of like pro Crusade based memes and all that, you know. So it's it's yeah. it's an extremely well made movie, just purely from a cinema, um, just from a cinematography point of view. Uh, even even generically ignoring the, the propaganda, it's generally well made, like script, acting, all that stuff. But then in the one area that matters and what ends up making it a pretty poor movie is in the, is in the presentation of the story. Because I think even I think even Ridley Scott would know that he's putting his own spin on things, so to speak. Because he even he even betrays um, he even betrays like the good guys as basically these secularist irreligious yeah. non-christians borderline so give us give us your take on this movie and it's, and it's especially bad myths that it's basically that it probably has helped propagate in the common thought. well well yeah like you said it's a beautiful film uh like those scenes of the battle are good and it's got great actors in it you know orlando bloom is in it it's got eva green mm. like it, it, a lot going for that movie except the facts <laughs> 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 so all right basically i broke it down uh hmm. the crusaders are the nazis in that movie the the templars are the ss and the muslims are the jews so pretty much uh, pretty much <laughs> as soon as king baldwin <laughs> <laughs> King Baldwin turns his head one way. Uh, it's got uh, Reynald de Chatillon and Guy of Lusignan or the Templars going mm -hmm. to kill innocent Muslims without any cause. It's like, oh, that's an armed caravan going to Mecca. Let's attack them. Boom. <laughs> now, <clears throat> and of course, there's just kind of like like factual errors like uh when one 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 one, one second first like an arm attacking an armed caravan that reminds me of a certain prophet from back in the day i'm not sure anyway keep going, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> <clears throat> that must have got cut in the final editing but so <laughs> uh <laughs> now th th there's kind of errors that are that that are that are there they're incorrect but they don't make the crusaders look bad like for example there's a battle of hatin where saladin defeats the crusaders and then after that it's got orlando bloom's character bailey and of who's 
horrifically portrayed. Like like Orlando Bloom's a good actor, but they they yeah. screw up Bailey. Yeah. You know, I don't care what God you believe in, as long as you fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's twelfth century Christians for you. you oh know? yeah, oh yeah, hundred percent. They were they, they, they were they were basically they were basically modern day Jesuits. That, that's basically. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Well, um, you have you you, you have after uh, you, you've got you got Orlando Bloom, and uh, uh, you, you got Balian and R Raymond of Tripoli, and a few others go to the scene of the battle after, where there's a bunch of a pile of dead bodies of knights and a bunch of birds flying around trying to, to peck the rotting flesh, and, and they're like, "Oh, he's going to be in at Jerusalem." in three or four days, three days format, to be at Jerusalem. Of course, after the, the, the Battle of Hattin was the 4th of July uh, mm -hmm. in 1187, he doesn't attack Jerusalem until late September. So it's oh, like wow. whole three okay. or four days, you know, no, like, oh. That, and maybe some, like, movie telescoping or something. Yeah. Okay. You see, uh, it's technically an error, but that's not an error that makes the Crusaders look bad. Now, I did mention that the Templars are th like the SS. <laughs> if you take a look, the scene at the beginning where Raymond of Tripoli, who they call Tiberius, is scolding Reynald. And then after that scene, he's talking to Balin. He's like, Oh, these these Templar bosters like Reynald of Chatillon. Reynald was not a Templar; he was a Crusader baron. But of course, to make him look as bad as possible, and in all fairness, he was not a good guy. Of all the guys they portray, I, I'm not going to complain if they made him look like a bad guy. But he wasn't a Templar. He wasn't a Templar. That's so dumb. <laughs> oh, like, he, like he was a baron. He had his castle and right. stuff. Okay. Um. Now, so yeah, the, the, they made him a Templar, but here is the most criminal thing they do. It, it, in the movie, uh, uh, basically the new king, Guy of Lusignan, is, is the king. Uh, mm -hmm. This is after uh, King Baldwin dies. Actually, King Baldwin died a couple years earlier and his nephew took over, but they just skip over that. But... Um, so yeah, King Guy tells Reynald, he's like, give me a war. And of course, there was a peace treaty at the time. And Reynald goes and raids a caravan uh, that had Salahuddin's sister. And that's actually confirmed by a primary source. There's a source that says his sister was part of that. And they capture the caravan and the people affiliated with the caravan. That actually happened. Hmm, okay. But... Uh, and now in, <laughs> now, in the movie, they send an envoy to Guy of Lusignan. It's like, it's like, oh yeah, we uh, Salahuddin will want all his stuff back. What response do you give to Salahuddin? He's like this, and he just impales him. But what? what at, and of course, the Crusader states go to war with Salahuddin. This is what actually happened. Ooh, There's okay. This is what actually happened. Reynald raided the caravan. That's true. Um, but he was not told to do that by Guy of Lusignan. He just did that on his own. He captures the caravan goods, the people, including Salahuddin's sister. That is true. Now, as soon as that happened, when word got to Salahuddin, he talks to Guy. Guy of Lusignan. He's like, look, look, King Guy, we've got a peace treaty. Uh, this guy hijacked my stuff. I know you had nothing to do with that. So just tell him to give my stuff back and it's all good. And so King Guy tells Reynald to give the stuff back. Go give him his stuff back. Ooh. And then he's like, he says, because uh, because uh, a lot of people contested his uh his kingship. And so uh, he's like, you 
have no authority over my land. He, uh, so therefore, I, I don't obey your command. So basically, he ignored what the king said. So king, instead of King Guy of Lusignol starting the whole conflict, he actually tried to prevent it. But of course, Rick. Ridley Scott, he didn't seem to care about that. Oh, dear. And um, yeah, so um, so it's actually the opposite. The only thing that is true is that Reynald hijacked the caravan. Oh, and by the way, it implies in the movie his sister was killed. I don't think that was true. The sister was still alive. But in the movie, they imply it's killed because they're like, Salah Houdin wants the body of his sister. You only want someone's body if they've been killed. And yeah, so <laughs> that is the most egregious error. Um, yeah, I think there's a few more, but I mean, like, I think the, <laughs> that's enough to know how insane that movie is. And it's so deceptive because it's it's very well made. It's got all these big actors in it. Um, and, mm. and, and, and that's all people learned. Well, it's a movie. Yeah. It must be true, right? We know the Christians were bad and the Muslims were so good. And like, it, it kind of... Uh, I, I just want to kind of touch on what you said. The um, the Islamic people aren't portrayed as super great either. They they try to make Salahuddin, yeah, he's Islamic, but they make him look like like a really tolerant dude. Like at the very end when he picks up the cross and puts it back up. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and 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 like it, 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 they kind of make him almost yeah, he's a Muslim, but he it make him kind of like a secular humanist almost. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, because when because uh, when he's n negotiating with uh, Balian, and Balian's like, "I'll destroy all the Islamic temples in the city," and then he's like, "I wonder it would if it would be better if you did." Like it's like, dude, he's talking about your holy sites, you know. <laughs> At least say like, "Don't you dare" or something like that, you know. But um, I, I don't know. It makes. Palian and Salahuddin. Yeah, they're the Christian and the Muslim, but it, it makes them look very kind of like a Well, modern... it makes the, the, the good guys of the movie the secular humanists. And then, yeah, as exactly. you said, the Templars, the SS, with just a dash of religious flavoring, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. No, it's yeah, pretty no, funny. Th th there are accounts of like, the Templars like protecting the Muslims while they're praying in Jerusalem. Like, oh, wow. uh, like for example, there's a story in, I can't remember. It's a chronicle. It's an Arabic chronicle. I can't remember the name of it. I, I've got it over there, but like where it's got the Templars in Jerusalem. Cause keep in mind under crusader control, about two thirds of the city was still I I Islamic. And, uh, like a, a new guy had come from like France or England. He had not seen a Muslim in his life. He sees him praying like this. He's like, "Oh no, you're not supposed to pray like that." And then the the, the Templars kind of kind of separate them. And then he's like, "Oh yeah, just go about and pray." This guy's new. He he doesn't know that you guys pray the way you do. And then he t the Templars tell him t to leave those guys alone. So like. It, it, it's like th there was no toleration until 1950 or after World War II, you know. Um, but no, th there's a lot of humanity on both sides and a lot of crazy stuff too, but there's crazy stuff today, you know. Mm. Uh, so. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's that's 100% true. Uh, Jack Ray, I never saw that movie. I don't recall hearing about it either. The 2005 movie I cared about was Star Wars Episode Three. It was probably about as fictional. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> in my except favorite style movie, movie. <laughs> except that movie, we know it's fictional. You know, no one expects any. <laughs> that. It presents itself as fictional. That's the difference. That's yeah, the difference. Yeah, that's a good oh, point. We got we got some spice from my buddy Chopa here. Why do the Greeks still cry about Constantinople? Zadar got also got sacked, but you don't see us complaining. <laughs> is, that, is that I put that in my article? I'm like, when's the oh, last time? You've heard a Hungarian complain about. Oh, Zara. please, please do explain this a little bit because this could, um, because like we're talking about bad crusades history generally, because like it's not okay. just Christian v Muslim history, but also 
Catholic versus, I, I think this is a Catholic versus Orthodox thing, or is it just? Uh, yeah, but, because like, I Orthodox. do know there's also big like. Because like the four, I think that sack of Constantinople is a source of a lot of bad blood with Catholics and Orthodox. But mm -hmm. so this is Zadar sacking. What is this? Could you explain this a little bit? Okay, so in the the Fourth Crusade, the the French Crusaders go down to v Venice, um, and basically they try to contract a fleet, but they had estimated, uh, they had way overestimated the size of the fleet. They wanted a fleet for thirty three thousand people. And only about a third showed up. So the Venetians are very angry. They're like, okay, to to pass over the time, how about you guys go and sack Z Z Zara? Because the Venetians had been fighting over um, So really, really quickly, really quickly. So uh, Tropium says Zada, not Hungary. So well, yeah. maybe it's now, now, it's true that today it's the modern day city of Z Z Z Zadar. And it's in Croatia, but back in okay. th those days, it was under the authority of the king of uh, the king of. Okay, Hungary. okay, cool. So we're talking about the same place. Got you. So uh, the, maybe, maybe this is maybe this is just some nationalist posting by Chopo to say it's yeah, ours. It's not Hungary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the um the 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 Venetians and the Hungarians are fighting over that city. It kept going <laughs> back and forth. So basically, the Doge of Venice. Enrico Dandolo basically said, all right, you, you, you can't pay enough. In the meantime, you guys take the fleet that we prepared for you and go and capture that city. So he captures the, the city. The, the, the Crusaders capture the city. It's a, not only is this a Christian city, but it's under the authority of the King of Hungary, who himself is under a Crusader vow. So not only have they attacked Christians, they've attacked fellow crusaders. And so uh, the, the Pope excommunicates the entire crusade at that point. The French write a l l letter to the Pope saying, we had no choice, you know, we, we were out of money and we had to pay for the fleet. And so the, the French got unexcommunicated, but the Venetians didn't send a letter. They're like, no, we were in the right. And Oops. so, so half the crusade was excommunicated. Far out. So yeah, far out. Okay, so not just the Easterners were screwed over, so to speak, with these kinds of crusades, <laughs> but even the West got some of that kicked back into them. Yeah, and it's it's uh, you, you don't hear the Croatians or Hungarians complain about that at all today. And those people were absolutely innocent; they didn't do anything. Whereas. If I had more time, I would talk about how uh, as much time as we want. Yeah, how two Greek emperors completely backstabbed the Crusaders. Uh, if you want, I could uh, go into that, but it'll take about ten minutes. That's fine. Yeah, please do go into oh, that. Sure. I, 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 right, sure. want. Yeah, yeah, because that's another that that is as I said, that's another big one, big source of bad blood um, okay, between so, the, the Easterners and the Westerners. So while they're in Zara they start communicating with an exiled prince, a prince of the Byzantine Empire named Alexius. His father was Isaac II, who had ironically impeded the Crusaders during the Third Crusade, but he, he got overthrown by his brother Alexius. Now, this is not the same... There's too many Alexiuses in this story. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> True but, that. Um, so there's the, the, the uncle Alexius, who, who overthrew Isaac II, he had him blinded and thrown in the dungeons in Constantinople. The son of Isaac II fled to Europe. And Alexius III, the bad uncle Alexius, is currently in Constantinople as emperor. So, um, basically, the young Alexius, the son of Isaac II, uh, is in going around Europe trying to find an army. Then eventually he corresponds with the Crusaders. He's like, hey, if you guys put me and my father on the throne of the Byzantine Empire, we will pay you 200,000 marks, which is more than enough to to pay for, for the fleet plus more. Because uh, keep in mind, they didn't have enough to pay for the fleet from Venice. Mm -hmm. Because not enough showed up. 
will will put the Patriarch of Constantinople in submission to the Pope. He'll join the Crusade himself with ten thousand troops, and he'll establish a permanent garrison of five hundred knights in the Holy Land. And the the Crusaders, a lot were suspicious, but they were they didn't have a choice. So <clears throat> they finally agreed. Then Alexius arrives in Zara. And the fleet sails to Constantinople. So they they uh, first dock in Chalcedon, where they're attacked by Byzantine troops. The French knights completely obliterate the Byzantine troops. Then Alexius III sends a letter to the Crusaders, and he essentially says, Oh, sorry, that was just a, a misunderstanding. We understand that you guys are off to the Holy Land. We wish you the best of luck. We can give you a bit of uh, supplies if you want. And uh, yeah, you guys can be on your way. Well, the Crusaders, they didn't respond. They they sail up to the walls and they show the prince. They show the young prince. But it unfortunately does not have the dazzling effect everyone wants. This is the summer of, of 1203. Then they... They uh, they move the ships into the Golden Horn, the, the Venetians, and the Crusaders are on th- th- in front of the land walls. These are the French, with the Venetians in the Golden Horn, and they attack the city. The, the Venetians take twenty five towers along the Golden Horn, and then a- a- Alexius the Third, who's the, the emperor. He panics. He flees the city. But he takes a lot of money from the imperial treasury with him. Keep in mind, one of the promises of, of, of young Alexius is that he would give 200,000 marks to the crusaders. <clears throat> so anyway, there's no emperor there. So they drag blinded Isaac II out of the dungeon, make him emperor again. He opens the gates of the city. His son comes in. He's crowned co-emperor. And the crusaders inform, they inform Isaac II of his uh, promise to his son that that, that, uh, the promise his son had made. And he's like, that's a lot, but I agreed to honor it. He agreed to honor it. So now um, at this point, and so... Uh, of course, there's not a lot of cash in the imperial treasury, so he pays half of the cash to the crusaders. He's like, I need a bit more time with the second half. And so the, the, the crusaders are like, all right. And then, now, as a few months go by, the people of Constantinople are mad. There's a, This guy has brought a foreign army, and he's paid him a ton of our money, um, yeah, so there's a guy named Marzophilus in, in Constantinople. That was his nickname. His actual name was Alexius, believe it or not. So <laughs> another, I know. One. another one. Yeah, so, uh, you, you, you have Isaac II and the young Alexius, uh, who was crowned as Alexius the fourth. Because remember, Alexius the third fled. He's out somewhere. <clears throat> And so you've got the co-emperors. Now, around this time, the father, Isaac II, he dies. So Alexius IV is governing on his own. <laughs> um, then you got this guy named Marzophilus, has Alexius killed, and he becomes emperor himself. So he's Alexius V now. And now the Crusaders are furious. They know they're not going to get their... Uh, their cash and uh he attacks the crusaders fails miserably but but keep in mind the crusaders are getting pretty low on supplies and stuff uh and so th- they decide to attack the city they were able to breach the walls on april 12th uh keep in mind this is after they had been attacked first uh by Mortso. in fact they tried filling up a b- bunch of empty ships with w- 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 wood. They lighted on fire and pushed it toward the 
because the Venetian ships in the Golden Horn, but the Venetians were able to to get out of the way since they're like the the masters of ships. They were able to maneuver. So um, they eventually took the city uh, and then they decided to pay themselves and loot mm. the city they did. They re- the booty was immense. And to this day, uh, and, and, and not just the 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 fancy stuff uh the cash but the r- relics the shroud of turin was taken from constantinople oh, wow. and also uh the bronze horses which are in saint mark's basilica in venice to this day and a ton of yeah. other stuff you know the the the, re- the relics of guys like St. John Chrysostom are in the Vatican. Well, how come they're in the <laughs> Vatican? Well, they come oh, from the, the crusade stack. You know, St. John Chrysostom was Archbishop of Constantinople. His crusade, <laughs> his relics should be there, right? But no, yeah. they're they're at the Vatican. Of course, uh, the Vatican in, in the last 20 or 30 years since through squ- squishy dialogue has given a few bones back. But... <laughs> The vast majority Chuck him a bone. Of- <laughs> throw, him a, throw him a bone, yeah. Um, yeah, so they're they're um they're they're, they're mainly so a tons of r- r- relics. In fact, if you find if you go anywhere in Europe, the Vatican or somewhere else, and find the relics of a Greek saint, you, you can guarantee that they pro- <laughs> you know where they came from. <laughs> especially in St. Mark's Basilica they have the skeleton of St. Mark they gave the hmm. skull t- to the, the Coptics of Alexandria since oh, uh, St. <laughs> Mark <laughs> but that hey, came, you guys that have his came head. from we'll Constantinople keep... <laughs> well, that's nice, hey, you guys can have his head but we'll, we'll keep the rest <laughs> well and uh, 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 a thing that's interesting is uh, there was M- Martsophilus who was uh He's crowned as Alexius V. He fled the city. Mm. Uh, a few months later, because remember, Alexius mm. III is still out there, and Alexius V, also known as Mordzovilus, is out there. They 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 come into contact, mm. and they decide to work together to get Constantinople back. But Alexius III betrays Mordzovilus and has him blinded. Mm. And so then he's blinded. He's walking the 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 plains of the emperor blind and he's picked up by crusaders who take him back to Constantinople and have him executed by throwing him off a pillar. And according to, according to this guy, Gunther of Paris, that pillar belonged to a stylite at one point, you know, the stylites, the people that were on the pillar for years. Yeah. Back in the day, that pillar had belonged to a stylite. So they, they threw him off the pillar and killed him. And, uh, yeah, they controlled the, the city until 1261 when a Byzantine successor state managed to take it back after the Battle of Pelagonia in 1259. Uh, so in, in 1261, they take the city back. Um and 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 that's when like all the alleged like atrocities and that happen after they take the city and yeah so they take the <clears throat> city in 12, 1204. <clears throat> there were a few pe- a small amount of people killed a few people r- 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 raped i'm not trying to justify this but the casualties were low it was mainly the stuff they took they <clears throat> took a lot of money uh yep. from the city um in yeah. fact, I heard an estimate. It's only an estimate, but because technically the Byzantines owed them money, they owed them a hundred thousand marks. Apparently, they took about nine hundred thousand dollars worth of marks from the city, so they they wow. more than paid themselves. All right, um, a city treasury that only barely needs like a barely needs like not even a million dollars. Imagine that a government that doesn't have to deal with billions and billions of dollars from like what thirty percent tax rates or whatever. <laughs> yeah, imagine that, eh? <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? All right. So, so, okay. So basically a very bad and unfortunate event, but not unprovoked. Um, the, yeah. the response may not have been justified, 
definitely not justified in many circumstances, but the the actual thing that caused there was something that caused it. it wasn't just out of spite or malice. Yeah, they they owed them cash, so they broke that promise. Not to mention uh, the the promise of joining the crusade and establishing a garrison in the Holy Land. All that was forgotten. Uh, yeah, the yeah, cash yeah. was never paid. Plus, they had attacked the, the crusaders first, both in the water in the Golden Horn and on land. Like uh, wow. Marzophilus sent an army to attack the. The French forces outside the land walls. Uh, th they were so utterly defeated <clears throat> that they captured. Uh, they captured an icon that they carried into battle. They captured the standard, and they almost Ooh. captured Mortzophilus himself. <laughs> Jeez, that that. In time. That sucks. Far that sucks. Okay, so far out some more demythologizing on on the sack of Constantinople. I think yes, I did earlier, much earlier. I linked to your article on uh, one Peter five on um, on that, the yeah. sack of Constantinople. So people go read that if you want to get a full uh, full take from Alan Rule. Basically, what you gave here, pretty much, plus some other details, I guess. Or yeah, there's a lot more details, yep. and there's stuff I couldn't include in the, the article. I'll share mm -hmm. something here. Uh, so yeah. as soon as they had put Alexius on the throne, this is young Alexius, Alexius the Fourth, and he paid them half the cash. Uh, a Turkish prince from Konya, who had exiled, he uh, he he saw what they had done. He's like, "Hey, do you think you can help restore me to the throne in, in Konya, which is uh, in in Turkey?" Uh, and, and he's like, "If you do this, I'll pay you a ton of money." And convert my empire to Christianity. Hmm. And the crusader said, No, we better not. We still need to get paid from the Byzantines. So yeah. Fair enough. Just, yeah. Far that's yeah. epic. Your no your knowledge in this is bloody vast. It's amazing. You can you can, it looks like you can go on for days about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it is. And specifically if you you want to read about that episode uh that episode you got to read this account robert of clary yep robert of clary got it got it. i'll put that one up ahead and i'm gonna look at this super chat we got here from freaking canadian catholic absolute legend thank you so much for yet another super chat it is really cool and uh but it's a spicy take crusades were one wrong two over and have no influence on what happens today love you all wrong interesting <laughs> it's wrong because they helped uh, cure the schism with the, the Maronites. That was done Ooh. with the Crusader state. So if you go to Lebanon today, the largest group of Christians is the Maronites. And they were a her heretical sect that the Crusader states helped to bring in, not by force, but through through proselytism and, and, and preaching right, there, yeah. to them. So yeah, it, it did have some positive influences. Now it it it's true that at the end of the the Crusades, toward the end in 1268, the, the city of Antioch was uh, completely completely killed, and because of that, it essentially ceased to function as a city. Um, Fire. So yeah, so th th there are some drawbacks too. I'm not gonna try to pretend mm -hmm. that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then I guess it would depend on what you when you say by wrong, you could say wrong in terms of oh, it was bad to ever call them. In which case, I presume you might you might say at least for the earliest ones that would not be the case because their responses to long aggression against I don't know I don't know what your take would that be. But then there's also the other sense of wrong in terms of oh well their practical outcome was crap. Um, in which case there could be more agreement on that, I guess. Yeah, like it's not a, a yes or no answer. Like, yeah. like uh, if yeah. you're a Catholic, Canadian Catholic, these were called by the popes. Uh, and um, there's pretty much like the the first one was to, there, there was two main goals. One was to protect the the Greek Christians from the Turks and, and get a lot of land back, which they did. They, they ended up getting like probably half of Anatolia back. Of course, the Turks would eventually take that in, in, in subsequent centuries. And also to liberate the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. And that was expressed uh, by Pope Urban, but earlier by Pope Gregory VII as well, uh, to restore it to Christianity. 
because I think in the the early thousands there had been a crazy Fatimid uh, ruler who had uh, who had demolished the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and like lo- like a, lo- a lot of people think he was crazy, but uh, but yeah, it, it, it was a, a it, it was a jihad. All right, there you go, there you go. And I'll, I'll, for one final thing, so we've covered what you do to go into Crusades history, how, how, well, just history in general, but particularly for this, um, some bad takes about Crusades history and actual facts that give the real picture and all that. And now, and now, as per, of course, the history theme, the current history theme on my channel, um, how do you think getting into all this so that people avoid the bad mistakes and can become as accurate as possible in reading those primary sources. How should people, generally speaking, just predispose themselves before and as they're diving into the sources? Like, how should they? How should they manage themselves, so to speak? Well, uh, j- just approach the sources and just say, you know, just say, look, these are people. Uh, they're not perfect. They make mistakes, but they're not like insanely cruel either. And so the thing I would say is to start with two books. I'm going to say two books. There's this one called the first crusade. Now this is a collection of sources. It's edited by Edward Peters. And of course it's got, it talks about, uh, you probably heard, that before the Crusaders went to the Holy Land, they killed a bunch of Jews in the Rhineland in Germany, right? I think so, yeah. I heard that. Yeah, so it talks about this. The Pope did not ever order that, and you, you can mm. find that out because it has all the speeches. And uh, so, uh, and then it's got the Jews, it's got their writings in it, and it talks about how certain local Catholic bishops were trying to protect the Jews from these rogue crusades. Wow. And All it right. even calls them righteous among the nations, which is like a Jewish yeah. title of honor for certain Gentiles. Far out. There and, you go. Yeah, yeah, and it talks about... Uh, again, it's not all positive. You know, it talks about the Crusaders doing some bad things. but So yeah, there's this. And then there's this. This is the Chronicle of Vulture of Chart. It's not that expensive. You could probably get this for thirty or forty dollars Canadian. I don't know what the the uh, equivalent in. Uh, I don't even know what the Australian currency. is. Probably called. twelve grand. <laughs> yeah, there's actually some of this in here, but this is the whole thing, and it continues into the the Crusader states. Mm-hmm. It goes to twelve. Uh, it goes to eleven twenty seven. So, okay. uh, they, and what's they, that one called again? Just to make it clear. Uh, uh, it's called a history of the expedition to Jerusalem, ten ninety five mm. to eleven twenty seven by Fulcher of Chart, and you spell that F U L C H E R, and Chartre is 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 Chart France. You know the place with the fancy church and right. Got ya. Got ya. All right. Yeah. Epic. Yeah. And so, so yeah, you have those big sources, and because I can see with with predisposing with predisposing ourselves to getting into the his, his, historical topics generally, but in particular these super controversial ones. Um, what would you say about how the I guess like the role of, or rather how to t- how to basically how to temper one's ideology? Because I think if we look throughout. Pretty much all takes, all bad takes on a controversial historical historical topic, virtually all of them tend to be from an ideological animus, which then pushes people towards that. How would you, because obviously you're a Roman Catholic, I can, I can imagine there is a temptation there to just go, oh, urban and all the crusade man, good, Muslim man, bad, Byzantine man, bad. But how do you temper that? How do you actually end up tempering that just so that you can honestly approach these sources? Well, I think the best way to do it is um, is to take a look at what happened at uh, the few decades prior to the Crusades. Mm-hmm. Like, what happened to the Byzantine Empire? How come the Byzantine Empire was asking for help from the uh, the the Pope? Um, 
it, it's because they're getting their butt kicked by the Turks who had come onto the scene and are not only uh, attacking the Byzantines, but attacking the, the the Islamic populations of the, the Middle East as well. And um, so, yeah, it's a call for help. And, you know, and keep in mind, although the two groups were split at this point, it was a very fresh schism, which usually could have been patched up. And as and I think a lot of the reasons the Crusades are 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 um, are viewed not too favorably by the Greeks is not just the Fourth Crusade, but you also have you also have Anna Comnena, who who wrote uh, some bad things about the the Crusaders in the mid twelfth century. Um, I, I I've got her writings over there. It's cheap; you can get that at Penguin Books. Because mm-hmm. um, she wrote a biography of Alexius Comnenus, who okay. was um, the, the her father who had appealed to the Pope, and uh, and and keep in mind there was a guy named R- R- Robert Giscard who attacked, who was a, a Norman who would always attack Byzantine land, and his son was actually a very important crusader. So when the people of Constantinople saw that the son of Robert Giscard was there. They're kind of like, uh, I, I, I don't know if we can trust this army. But uh, yeah, so just you, you need to know the whole context. It's not like the yeah. the. So yeah, it's essentially learn the whole context. It's not just like, hey, let's go and attack Jerusalem. No, there's a wider context. Yes. 100% something very very big happening. And I think I think that's um I think that's I think that's pretty much about it. I think it was good at the very beginning. I would have asked you normally at the end, but I think it was actually very good at the beginning. You dumped all these primary sources and all that so now people can uh the first few ones I typed up at the top, but people can also just listen through and you and hear um hear the titles as you as you say them. So that's good. You've done that. And I think that's that's pretty much that's pretty much that for this. So this was so this is very good because, well, for one, apart from just all of all the facts and all that, you just drop left, right, and center. Also, just the nature of the 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 topic and how it's abused, and then how one should actually really just how one should get into it in order to avoid those many many abuses of the historical topic. So now, ladies and gentlemen, Q and A is happening right now. I think there is a couple of questions already, but if you well, I highly encourage people, if you have any questions on this, dump them right here and either myself or Alan, and particularly for Alan, can answer them. Is it, is um, it okay if I say something? Uh, yes, please like, go for it. Yeah, so, like, so guys, subscribe to my channel. And also, if you have any oh, yes. questions about anything uh, I said here, you can contact me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Uh, just say, hey, Alan, what was that book you said uh, that – that talks about this, you, you know, just, just talk to me and, and I'm very open about it. Yep. hundred percent. Perfect. Perfect. I've got your channel link here and it's in the description of the video stream itself. So people can go can go and subscribe, which they should absolutely should. Fantastic. Even though he is a Romanist, but he is a noble Romanist. So I can say that. <laughs> so now let's go through questions. I think I saw one higher up. Um, bu- 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 okay, here's one. So from Senora Famado, good to see you. Is it true that without the Crusades, the West would be Muslim? What would have been a better way to deal with Muslim aggressions? Well, n- uh, it, it, it's tough to play that game. Like it's tough to play the whole alternate history game because because uh, keep in mind you also had like that was not the only Islamic Christian front. You also had Spain Mm -hmm. and in Spain uh, during the crusades, they were going through the Reconquista, uh, Mm -hmm. slowly taking land back that had been taken in the the seventh and eighth century. Um, It's hard to say. And I don't like playing the whole alternate history game. Um, like it's like, oh, if the states, uh, if the states didn't go into World War II, all of Europe would be speaking German. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's tough to play that game. If, if I had to take a guess, be, because keep in mind, the top 
uh, the whole re reason that there are I Islamic populations of e e Europe in the Balkans is because of the Ottoman Empire. Mm. And they started in 1289. And keep in mind the, the, the Crusader state. And, and keep in mind, as soon as they started, they're very, very small. And keep in mind that Crusader states fall in 1291. Keep many things in mind. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's basically the, the Ottomans who spread a lot of Islam to Europe. And um, that was pretty much independent of the Crusades. So mm. There you go. There you go. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, do you, Okay, this might be, I don't know if I'm, this might be out of your purview, but what would be a better way to deal with Muslim aggressions? I don't know if you'd want to answer that or because it's a bit... Bit more on the speculative side, but yeah. Um, at what time and what place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'd be that'd be true. Yeah, like, well, I'd go all the way. I'd, I'd I'd go all the way back to Muhammad. <laughs> Just nip it at the bud. <laughs> well, well, well. Keep in mind, by the time he died, the Muslims were still in Arabia at that point. Yeah. They 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 only uh, started invading a couple years after he had died. So, but uh, yeah, there's a whole story to that, but they attacked at a time where uh, basically you had a war between the two superpowers, the Persians and the Byzantine Empire, and this war lasted a quarter century. Their troops and, and resources were all depleted. Um, so yeah, that kind of allowed it. Like... Uh, but it it's it it's kind of like asking, uh, would you go to war with the Empire of Japan in 1939? No, that's suicide. The states could probably do it, <laughs> but uh, would you go to war with Empire of Japan in 1946? Well, yeah, they're what empire? <laughs> they're obliterated, you know. Yeah. So like, yeah, fair like that's yeah. how it was. You know, two superpowers were exhausted. And uh, so, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. That's good. Thank you for that. And now we have Elijah Horber. Good to see you, cuz. Question Is it true a lot of bishops and priests went into battle, i.e., Anselm of Havelberg, having led a northern crusade and he was a bishop? Uh, I don't know if a lot went into battle, but there are, certainly are uh, priests and bishops who did go into battle. I know it's a weird thing, but they did that back then too. In fact, it was a, a priest, Dayum of Clary, who breached the wall uh, when they sat Constantinople. So, uh, Very interesting. Yeah, yeah it's a, yeah, it's a thing that was done back then. It's not done anymore. Like mm -hmm. if a Catholic country goes to war, like there's priests, obviously, but they're chaplains, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Army chaplains are not exactly busting out the guns, although yeah. that would be a really bloody cool shot. <laughs> <laughs> i've imagined i've actually imagined like because i used to i used to like um i used to like writing stories every now and then a bit as a when i was younger and i, I kind of actually want to get back into it but i imagine a really cool um movie premise of like uh like i don't know like a like a priest who former like special forces or something but he announced it and he just goes into the peaceful priestly life but then some bad guy group I, i'm kind of fuzzy on who it would be but they like they be, and he'd probably be in, in like I don't know Lebanon or something something where this kind of thing could happen and they like mm. bust into his church shoot it up and take a bunch of people hostage and then he goes back into his like special forces ways and <laughs> just, just mushroom so, up. so it's like, it's like the movie <laughs> Taken except the priest <laughs> does what Liam Neeson does yeah and it's an entire and it's like half a congregation or something <laughs> and it's like and it's like I, I get like John Wick vibes or something I don't know but. <laughs> just like, just imagine that a guy in a massive, just in a massive cassock, and then with like two M4s or something in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Anyway, to a bit, bit spicy, but um, what else have we got? Da, 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 da. Uh, wouldn't it wouldn't it be more accurate to say that much of Europe would have been Muslim had they beat Charles the Hammer? Yeah, that yeah, that's true. That's true. Oh, wow. Yeah, keep in mind around that time, the uh, the Muslims. <laughs> suffered four huge defeats because i said the first muslims were uh 
the, uh, part of the, the Arab Empire, and they suffered four major defeats in uh, about the span of 10 years uh, at Tours in 732. That was one of them against Charles the Hammer. There was also the Battle of Covadonga in 7... Uh, they don't know the exact year, but somewhere between 718 and 722. So two b- big losses over there. Yeah. Meanwhile, go t- to the other side of uh, Europe. You got the siege of Constantinople in 717, 718. It fails. And you've got the Battle of Ardabil in 730, where the Khazars were able to defeat the Arabs. And by about that time, the jihad jihad of the Arabs, with those four big losses, was at an end. The, the borders crystallized, the Christian and Islamic world, and, uh, and basically, by then, it was slowly ch- chipping back at the Arabs. But, but they had conquered a lot. So yeah, I think I uh, agree with our friend, Mr. B- Mr. Blackmon there. Yeah. Wow, that's actually significant hearing you say that because I, I kind of had that feeling as well looking at the strategic position of, um, was it Tours? Was that That's where it was, the Battle of Tours? Yeah, in France. Yeah, so looking at that strategic position, I was like, oh, wow, that's the corridor to Western Europe. So I kind of imagined that, but to hear kind of a confirmation from you, like, whew, far out. So thank God he had, God had his mercy on us at that, at that battle. <laughs> and... Da, 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 da. Okay, Elijah Hallberg, why did the Battle of Ice occur? Interestingly, the Russian guy in the Battle of Ice is one of our saints in Eastern Orthodoxy. Is he talking about uh, uh, is he talking about Alexander Nevsky? Um, not sure. I have no idea what this battle is. <laughs> because I know he's a saint. I uh, unfortunately, Elijah, I'm not I'm not an expert on this. Like I do a lot of history reading, but if there's something I'm not an expert on, I'll I'll say right up front. It's hard to get stuff about the Northern Crusades. I don't think they're all translated. Um but I'd like to learn more about this. Uh it's it's something I like to know more about. So I might look into that later, but I I I can't help you. Uh, I'm sorry, Elijah. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, but, 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 but I think this one's kind of for me. Uh, the other Paul, I recently talked to a Romanist who was upset that the Queen, kings of Sweden used force, but I told him that he might have some problems with the papacy's armies. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like every, every pretty much every tradition that has like a, a few centuries under their belt. If you're going to complain, oh, your leaders did bad things, pretty much anyone can point back and say, your, your leaders did bad things. So, I mean, what, what gives? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's well, that's I, that's oh, yeah, you want to say something? Well, it's it, it's it's kind of a vague question, like the kings of Sweden in what time period? Like, <laughs> I guess, like, yeah. like the, there's technically, I think, a king of Sweden today, right? But uh, and the, the papacy's armies, like, are are you talking about the the Crusaders? You know, because technically, the, I guess there were some soldiers in the papal states, but I I I don't think the papal states was something that like expanded and captured other people's land mm, right but um yeah so if he wants to give a bit more d- details there um of the guy he talked to um but uh right fair enough fair enough yeah um bu- 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 Oof, I recall that Luther got in trouble for saying the papacy was worse than the Ottomans. He called them. <laughs> Bloody hell, Luther. <laughs> I don't think I'd even agree with him on that <laughs> as much as yeah. I don't like the papal office. <laughs> well, I mean, in, in uh, that that's true because um, the Protestant Reformation, like keep in mind, Martin Luther, he lived in the Holy R- R- Roman Empire for for his whole life essentially and um of course the guy in charge for his whole life was charles v who was a staunch catholic and hated luther and all that stuff but the whole reason he couldn't do anything about it he had the turks on one side and the french on the other so he was fighting a two-front war and if you're fighting a two-front war it's hard to deal with heretics and no one knew what this would become you know it might it, it, it might just 
evaporate as a movement you know no one knew Mm. um but it's true that in 1528 or 29 i can't remember the exact year that he wrote uh about the Turks being the Antichrist, but the Pope was also the Antichrist as well. And they're different kind of Antichrist. It's been a long time since I've read this stuff. And in about 2012, I read about 2,000 pages worth of Martin Luther's writings. Uh, but that, that's that, that, that's about 10 years ago. I don't r- remember. I don't remember a lot of that th- these days. Uh, papacy was worse than the Ottomans. I think he he thought the papacy was worse than the, the Ottomans. I think the the only group he would put worse than the papacy is the Jews. Is, <laughs> I'm not kidding. As bad as he oh. talked about the papacy, you should see his writings on Jews. You know. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Chris and them, then, cranks it up a few notches it's, it's oh my gosh it's something that's that's so true criticism on steroids it's something that like every whenever there's like a church history class and it goes to the reformation and luther they always feel like the obligatory apology for on the jews in their lives like oh he wrote this bad thing and it influenced anti-semitism and hitler and all that jazz and uh, it's, it's, it's it's so cringe like okay you've apologized enough we get it let's, let's, let's move on <laughs> Okay, Jew hate bad. We get it. Let's go. <laughs> um, and da, 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 da. okay, Tropium or Tropo. Does Mister Rule intend to explore the Battle of Ziget slash Ziget slash Ziget Var between Nikola Sh- uh, Shubich Zrinsky and the Ottomans? Bro. Okay, was that um, the battle in? Be- because I've. St- studied quite a, a bit of Ottoman history. So are you talking about 1456 when um, Mehmet the Conqueror was sieging Serbia, like a few years after he had taken Constantinople? Like, like I don't know, because a lot of those Slavic names just are blurred to me. <laughs> um, so oh, I could hear an echo here. Might be me. I don't know. Actually, I don't think it's me. Okay. So, um, I can start. Uh, so, Hungary, Sultan dies in the tent. Did I give any more details or? Uh, I can't help you there. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, oh, this is interesting. Not sure if this is off topic. No, it's not at all. If it's a crusade, it's on topic. But what do you think of the Bosnian crusade, the one against the Gnostic church? What is that? I've never, I'm not heard, familiar. Of that. I've never heard of it either. Like I know there were crusades in the North, but I, oh, um, well, I know there were a few crusades into the, the Balkans in the late 1300s and early 1400s, uh, the Crusade of Nicopolis and the Crusade of Varna, but but those were to halt the, the Turks, not against the Gnostics. Right. Oh, oh, um, are you possibly re- referring to uh, the Albigensian Crusade? Like, technically, that's in France, but those those were against a group that had Gnostic beliefs is is that what you're talking about blackmon um i guess we'll i guess we'll wait a little bit uh, he said not that one okay um hmm interesting um truth is beautiful i think he thought that luther thought the papacy was worse it was the antichrist yeah. he thought false religion should be banned just like johan Eck, islam or rabbinic judaism yeah, no, that's um, true, six in Bosnia were called Bogumili. Okay. Oh, the Bogumils. Um, <clears throat> what year was this crusade? Does he know? I don't know a lot about this. Again, um, Dalton says 1235 to 1241. Huh. I'll tell you what, I'll do some r- r- research on that. Fair enough. Fair enough. Very good stuff. 
Um, sorry, we got a, we got a number hey, of hey, questions here. Oh, 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 guys, hey, hey guys, I got something. I need a new project. I have the the Ooh. Fourth Crusade. I've read every single thing available in English on that. Uh, hmm. in, in terms of primary sources. So like, like that's my project. That's the one thing I knew better than pretty much anyone else like online. So uh, if, if you guys want me t to research something, put it in the comment section. I need a new project. I, I I'm thinking Ooh. I have it, but, uh, but yeah, I'm open to suggestions until I fully commit. I'm open. Hear that people? That's 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 pretty big. That's pretty epic. <laughs> hey, Matty, good to see you, man. Hey, just dropping in. I'll have to rewind. One hundred percent. This is very good and very educational. You definitely want to take a look at this. Um, blah, 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 blah. Right to so okay. I'll hopefully hopefully be able to get through all the questions so that we can then get to meme review and then finish up. Um, eh, da, 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 Bosnian Crusade. Why did King Louis of France Crusade in Egypt fail? Well, he, uh, okay, this is the Seventh Crusade. Now, uh, if, if you want, I recommended this because it, because half the book is about the Fourth Crusade, half the book is about the Seventh Crusade. Mm -hmm. um, now, and, and that's the Crusade of King L Louis. So, so I'll tell you uh, a bit about that Crusade. So, the plan was to take take Egypt because if they can take Egypt, then the, the, the people in Egypt were the ones who controlled uh, Jerusalem. And at this time it's uh, the, the Ayyubids who that was the same empire as Saladin. Of course, Saladin is long dead by this time. So King Louis the ninth goes on crusade and he, uh, it, it failed for a couple reasons, but I think the big reason was, and this was bad. He, although he didn't do too much damage to them, he destabilized their empire. It caused a coup, and the Mamluks take over. Now these people are dangerous. These were the slave armies uh, of the Ayyubids, and now technically under Islamic law, a Muslim's not allowed to own a Muslim slave, hmm. but not every Islamic empire followed it to a T. So they did a revolt because King Louis destabilized them and the Mamluks got to power, who were these crazy guys under bay bars. And he was able to defeat Louis the Ninth. So that's why it failed. You, you know, it was enough to destabilize it but as soon as these wackos come to power, and these people would end up finishing off the Crusader states. So King <laughs> Louis' crusade was a disaster, not just in the context that he lost it, but the long-term effects that it caused. The, the, the Ayyubids, who no longer posed a threat to the Mamluks, who posed a huge threat. There you so, go. Yeah, Far out. Yeah. So pick up this book. It's about 20 bucks Canadian. Again, I don't know what, what, what the exchange is, but it's got a, a fourth crusade source and a seventh crusade source. Okay. So it's, it's very good. Great, great, great bang for the buck. Awesome. Very awesome. Far, I got a number of questions today. Far out. Uh, didn't the Turks tolerate Protestants when they took over Hungary, partly because it was, it undermined any pro Austrian or Catholic support there. Yeah, the the Turks were very good at exploiting the fractures in Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant, but Catholic and Orthodox as well. Like um, when uh, when Constantinople was taken, Constantinople had been under the Union of Florence because it was being enforced by the emperor. Well, now that the emperor had died in battle. Uh, there was no reason to have the union anymore. So the Sultan appointed a patriarch who was anti-union and he, and the Turks made sure that only the anti-unionists became patriarchs. Same with Protestants. They, they, uh, 
use that split to uh, uh, against the Catholics. And keep in mind, a, a lot of Protestants sided with the, the Turks against the Catholics too. It's not just the Turks that were doing this. Um, uh, like, for example, I think it was Queen Elizabeth who was supplying the Ottomans with tin at the Battle of Lepanto. And Catholics even sided wow. with the Turks when it suited them, like France. Like France wow. uh, purposely didn't get involved in the Battle of Lepanto um, for for uh, pragmatic reasons too. So th there's a lot of, uh, in fact, um, I, I've got a, a, a biography of Pope Pius V. Now, it's not a primary source, unfortunately, but he he talks about in this biography, in fact, I wrote a re review of this book on, on 1 Peter 5. Uh, it came out la about this time last year. Um, and um, he, he basically went, you know, the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. He was the Pope at the time. He dies about six months later, and on his deathbed, he is l lamenting the Catholic powers who did not want to fight the Ottomans for one r reason or another. Like, I think he complained about the, the Venetians, mm -hmm. um, yeah, who, who the French, uh, and, um, yeah, who who had concerns like the Spanish? Even there's times when the Spanish didn't even want to do this. See, see, that's the thing about history. You know, you think you have these countries that are loyal and Catholic, uh, but no, like a lot of times they act in their own self interest. Like I think the Poles as well. They also didn't want to fight the Ottomans. And Poland is as Catholic as you can get, right? Yeah. <laughs> Far out. Okay, so as you as you say towards the very beginning, extremely, extremely complicated histories of everything. It's not so. It, it even gets to the point where it's not always just Ottoman versus Catholic, or Ottoman versus Christian. It's a bit of Ottomans and some Christians fighting some other Christians, and it gives me unfortunate reminiscing to the Lebanese Civil War, which, like for which, like as 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 unknown as it is, is to me one of the because obviously because like my mum's side of the family is from there so i know about it um and as little known as it is it looks a lot like that and as such is very like gross when you see christians siding with heathens to fight other christians it's just it's it's the it's the worst lowest display you can see in just and it almost almost one of the worst things you can do as a christian in that way it's 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 unfortunate well, in the, the 1260s, I can apply th that to the Crusades. In mm -hmm. the 1260s, um, th when they're getting their behind kicked by uh, the Mamluks under Sultan Baybars, who I just brought up, while that was going on, there was a lot of infighting. In fact, there was a civil war where you had uh, the Templars on one side and the Hospitallers on the other. The, the Knights Hospitaller were another uh, wow. group of Knights similar to the Templars. And uh, yeah, no, in fact, during the Third Crusade, uh, there was a succession struggle because uh, a guy named Conrad of Montferrat was trying to usurp the crown from Guy of Lusignan. And so, like, okay. Richard the Lionheart, it's not like he, all right, there's the Muslims, I have to go defeat them. That was not the only thing. He also had to deal with kind of the, not quite civil war, but huge dispute inside his kingdom. Like, the French were backing one guy, he was backing another. You, you know, it was very awkward, you know. But yeah. that's how humans are, yeah. right, you know? Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately. This might be a bit far, but could the Spanish Armada be considered a crusade since it had papal support? I do believe it was a crusade. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe Pope Sixtus V uh, called it a crusade, gave the standard plenary indulgence because uh, 
because keep in mind England was considered a heathen nation there, and and King Philip the second was married uh, to Queen Mary, who was long dead, and Elizabeth was ruling. So yes, fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. Um, I think that might almost be it. Um, bah, 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 bah. yeah, I think that's. I think that's just about it for question. Actually, hang on. We had um, we had a suggestion for a project for you. Um, oh. by where is he? Where is he? Where is he? So many. Blah blah blah. Uh, come on. Where is it? It was right here. It was, it was literally right here. He suggested a project. Okay, here we go. Alan Rule, project for you. Who advised the crusade against Kingdom of Bohemia over communion in both kinds? Okay. Um, l- like, I think I know what he's talking about. He's talking about J- Jan Hoos. And uh, I, th- this is something I know a bit of. I don't know as much as I'd like to, but it, it was the Pope at the time. I... I, I uh, I don't exactly know who the Pope was. Keep in mind, this was uh, like around the time of the Council of Constance, because that's a cons- uh, the the council that had declared Jan Hus a heretic. And uh, so pr- the Pope of the early 1400s, because I know Jan Hus, he took from John w- Wycliffe his version of extreme predestination. So w- we don't know who saved and therefore if we don't know if you you can't guarantee someone's a christian how can they claim to to be the pope (laughs) uh a a, a person who's actually pretty good on this is carl truman who's a a protestant uh historian he he's i i don't think i've ever seen anything from him uh and 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 this guy's a staunch protestant too yeah so like it so like it's it it's good stuff. He's talked about a lot of this stuff. Of course, he gets into a lot about the, the, the theology, um, and 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 keep in mind the the stuff that was going on in Bohemia. It, it's not just uh, a, a crazy priest who's gone rogue. He he's being like supported by the, the secular lords who are protecting him. So this was equally against them. I can't remember. The name of the king at that time uh but uh yeah got yeah fair enough and i think we'll take one more question before we hit up the main review alan rule so do you think the crusades were divinely ordered like joshua's war or just some wars some just wars and some not i think it's more the latter some just some not um because uh, like it, it, it's not ordered like Joshua's wars. Like, j- l- l- like Joshua's a, a prophet. The Pope's not a prophet. Yeah. But like um, it, 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 it's kind of like even if I, 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 I thought uh, that they're all super good, like, like every crusade's amazing, I still would not put it uh, on par with Joshua's wars. It's kind of like, it, it, it is a Latin Vulgate, an inspired translation. Uh, like, for example, it is the Latin Vulgate, like, like infallible. I'd say probably to the same extent that the Septuagint is. So it's not infallible, but it's like as good a translation as you get. But it's not the divine word. The divine yeah, word right. is in, in Greek and Hebrew. Mm. Uh, I hope that wasn't a bad analogy, but <laughs> but no, I'm no, saying it's no similar sense, but yeah. not the same thing. Yeah, so. yeah, that's it. There you go. There you go. Fair enough. Very fair enough there indeed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is this. It's been this excellent, uh, excellent interview discussion here with the legendary Alan Rule. Indeed, you are legendary. Um, with his great, fantastic knowledge, primary source knowledge, especially on the Crusades. And not and not just the mere facts, but also bad takes in it. How to avoid it? How to approach the how to approach the topic properly? And this is stuff you can apply to pretty much any other historical topic out there, as controversial or non controversial um, as as they come. Because in the end, it is history is by definition in the primary sources. So get into that. Make that your make that your your number one goal here. So 
Alan, before we get into the meme review, thanks heaps. Do you want to give your plugs one more time before we do that? Yeah, like I've got an old website that I don't um, I don't go on anymore. It's called AlanRule.com. It was basically against Islamic apologetics. I, I don't update it. I don't update it anymore, but it's still all there if you want to go read it. You can find me on on basically any social media under Alan Rule A L L A L L A N R U H L on Twitter on Facebook. Uh, YouTube, I'm at Alan Rule. Um, so go subscribe mm-hmm. to my YouTube channel. I've got some interesting stuff coming up there. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. And subscribe to the Paul's channel as well. <laughs> of course, do nuke the subscribe button here and carpet bomb and sack the like button, ladies and gentlemen. Please do do all that. And we'll all my many other social media as well, as well as my subscribe star i'm still waiting for that to get approved by the subscribe star team they're taking their sweet time um, so i emailed them again to hopefully speed up that process but uh god willing it should be up relatively soon i can't exactly give a time but uh, once it is then both my former patrons and anyone who wants to start supporting me will be able to do so once it's up but now for the epic finisher of this stream let me just open up that window yep share share screen share window Ladies and gentlemen, we've got meme review. Now we're here. We got. We've got. We got. We're going to be peer reviewing these memes with Alan Rule himself. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them relevant to the theme of today's discussion topic. Um, so <laughs> before we begin, Alan, uh, we need to figure out a rating system. What What's your rating system going to be for these memes? Uh, one out of five, out of, or like out of five, I don't know. So it could be so like people, different people. Like for example, I might often give them like. Uh, let's say one to 10 shekels or um, one to five, um, like en- just pretty much anything. So I don't know if you just want to go with just the raw one to five or one to five um, marks or <laughs> something like that. Uh, since we're, well, yeah, let's, let's do shekels, you know. <laughs> one to five? Yeah, one to five. All right, one to five shekels. That's our rating. Um, that is our rating system for this meme review, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go to the first one. I promise not to get any religious arguments. Three drinks later. <laughs> I'd give that four. Four? Yeah, nice and solid. Because it's true. It's, it is extremely true. That's me. That is that is actually me when I'm out with all my Catholic buddies at one of our favorite pubs. <laughs> it gets very, very fun. Oh man, so a solid four, very nice, very nice. I'm sure the Templars were, were, were had three drinks in them when they they rode into battle. I'm sure Ridley Scott had twelve drinks in him when he was writing that movie. <laughs> yeah, probably. Next one: strong woman in Hollywood movies uh, shows slash movies starter pack. This half shave haircut, shoulders as big as a man, lesbian or bisexual, displays all the characteristics of a toxic male. <laughs> Uh, that that's maybe less, maybe a two or a three. I mean, it's so true, though. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but like I, I'm saying that to like, like, like I don't like seeing the the lesbian bisexual. Fair enough. Like, fair enough. Next, you know. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's still pretty <laughs> good, but yeah, that's true. Next, Duolingo. Looks like you forgot your Spanish lessons again. You know what happens now? Rocket attacks. Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Ashkelon, and Ashdod. <laughs> 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 that's four that's four solid four solid four solid <laughs> i agree four. i i i have to give it a straight five because when i first saw this one i just i just lost it it was <laughs> it was beautiful <laughs> all it's the pretty, duolingo memes about it, him knocking like, on threatening five's his... door sorry it's knocking on five's door fair enough <laughs> that's a good <laughs> it works well oh man and next Take me somewhere expensive. <laughs> Games Workshop. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it, it, it's a pretty good meme. Uh, it, it, it's off topic. I'm gonna give that one a, a four again. I got a high standard for a five. Yeah, no, that's totally fair enough. That's totally fair is, enough. Is, 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 Jack is Ray says I don't. Girlfriend or? Jack Ray says I don't get this Duolingo one. Okay, let's go back. Let's explain it. 
to, to explain memes now. The funny thing is that there's two notifications that are unfortunately placed. And the first one is, you forgot your Spanish lessons. You know what happens now? And then right after that is a red alert for rocket attacks in Israel, <laughs> Israeli cities. <laughs> like, whoa, I forgot my Spanish lessons and now there's rocket attacks in Israel? What the heck? That's, that, that's disproportionate. <laughs> Did World War Three started? Oh, and man. Look, same it's... date on them, 8-11. There you go. Next one. Telling a stoner they have an addiction and versus telling an alcoholic they have an addiction. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. I, I, I think that may be the best one yet. That one's pretty good. <laughs> so I, I think we'll bring out the five for that one. Nice. Very nice. Because it is true as well. And yeah. oh dear, the, the wall of text is the, the Levon affair. Don't Google the Levon affair, people. <laughs> Oh man. When the teacher thinks you're studying, but you're actually planning to retake Jerusalem. <laughs> oh okay. Okay. I think that that deserves a five. I've seen I've seen memes with that guy that guy in a before, you know, just the the guy with the Templar helmet and Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's there's even this um Oh, I forgot what they called. I think they called Bread Boys or something, this YouTube channel. And it's like a father and son and they're both in like Crusader outfits and they just do like really funny stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh, Jack Ray. The alcoholic is addicted, but they can stop whenever they want. <laughs> that's a nice meme. Yeah, They say that a lot. <laughs> oh man. And next one. Hang on, I'm going to zoom out because it's all low res. What, this is what the establishment fears. Yeah, no, <laughs> no I, I agree. I agree that that is what they fear. I, I, I'd go. They want the race wars. They want yeah, race exactly. wars. Exactly. They want uh, us to be. See, in in Canada, we currently have the reconciliation movement. You know, between the First Nations people and the. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Catholics and the, the people, the, the, the white people, essentially the reconciliation movement because of the school, the re residential schools and other things. But the whole reason of the reconciliation movement is to keep us separated. That's the, that's what they don't tell you. Yeah. We, we, there's pretty much the same thing with Australia. Like there's no single, no single organization, I guess, but it can be described as like a, a movement that involves many activists and organizations, but with us and our indigenous. Um, but there, it's always just, it always just is just like, oh, National Sorry Day every year. So literally every year giving it, renewing the apology um, or what have you. Um, and then everywhere in like major institutions, they'll do like the welcome to country and uh, we recognize the, um, we, we, we pay our respects to the traditional owners of this land, the, the, the Aora people, the, the Bangawanga people, whatever they're, whatever they're called in the local area. Um, and <clears throat> it's just the, the, their whole thing is just to make sure you never forget. It's not actually about, and they use the word reconciliation here too. That's a very, very <laughs> common thing of it uh, here as well a common theme of a reconciliation and yet the whole point of reconciliation is that you you recognize it you get over it move on forget it that's what reconciliation is and yet yeah. everything they do is designed to keep it in the back of our uh, we we'll keep it in the front of our minds and to keep people divided that's how it always happens yep so it's exactly the same here exactly the same here it's unfortunate but that's unfortunately how it goes um yeah so four ooh. for that one yeah, solid four. You never know about two dudes next to a grill. They may already be forming a militia. Ooh, scary. <laughs> oh, well, man. that's how Blackwater was started, right? <laughs> I don't know about that. I can't, oh, I, okay. I can't enjoy that. Oh, well, maybe one day. Um, so this is what the establishment is. Uh, Enrico, we missed the Holy Land. We're not aiming for the Holy Land. Siege of Constantinople, 1205. <laughs> Oh, that's Enrico Dandolo, the Doja Menace. Oh, nice. <laughs> that guy did some research. God, <laughs> <that guy. laughs> this one was good. I, I legit, that's I found it like good. very, very quickly. I was like, oh, damn, this is good. <laughs> yeah, no, if you don't know who Enrico Dandolo is, that 
that won't make any sense. It, it makes as much sense as far as I know what the meme is, like Toy Story and all that. And then just the, the end result is Siege of Constantinople. I just know that. And that just makes it funny enough for me. So how would you rate this? Uh, I'm going to say four. Nice. Nice. Very nice. Four shekels. Four shekels. And yeah. I think there's one. The, 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 the thing that is... Uh, Pr- that th- that kind of takes away from it is that it kind of takes away all the Im- imagination at, at the very bottom. They just say, "Well, here's the answer." Uh, the fourth crusade, but the, but then again, a lot of people might. All know. right, yeah, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. And I believe that's all we have for memes right now. And I believe that's the that's it. That's all we have for this uh, this stream today. Um, yeah, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on. It was absolutely awesome. Even I, I learned a whole ton. Thanks. Uh, thanks. And if there's anything you uh, made to talk about, come back on and uh, to to talk about certain historical events. There's some parts of history I know well. There's some parts I don't know at all and everything in between. So if it's something I know well, I'm, I'm happy to come on and talk about it. Fair enough. That's awesome, man. I definitely do want to have you on again. Maybe some, I don't know, there's a billion topics we can go look at. We'll see which way the wind blows. But uh, thank you very much, Alan. And thank all of you viewers very much for coming along. I hope every single one of you enjoyed this greatly. And as you probably see on my channel, we got a billion more streams in the lineup. Um, Just tomorrow, I'll be with my friends. I'll be with my Danish Lutheran friend, to discuss whether Jesus actually spoke Greek because there is a minority but a fairly persuasive, well-evidenced hypothesis that Greek was actually the primary language of Judea in the time of Christ. So that would be very, very interesting if that is the case. So he'll be making that case on my channel tomorrow as well as a bunch of other stuff coming up after that. You can see it all on my channel. Subscribe, like, and do the same for Alan Rule's channel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming along. This has been The Other Paul. This has been Alan Rule. I hope you have a blessed day or evening. God bless.